In these Masters of the Air clips, we see crew members both coping with the cold environment and becoming injured by cold exposure. The intent of this video is to address the incidence of cold injury as depicted in the series and address what steps the heavy bombers took to mitigate the effects of the cold environment. Heavy bombers flew between 20 and 30,000 foot altitude. The high altitude was needed to minimize the threat of ground artillery flak, as discussed in this declassified June 1943 Headquarters 8th Air Force Memorandum titled, Notes Taken at Meeting Concerning Medium Bombardment. The purpose of the meeting was for the RAF to share their experiences with regard to German flak. The table rates the flak threat within the listed altitude bands. At altitudes over 20,000 feet, heavy flak loses its accuracy. B-17 bombers were unpressurized and virtually unheated. Crew members were exposed to extreme environments. Cabin temperatures were routinely around minus 50 to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Crew members manned the bombers while on life support. In addition to an oxygen system, they were kept warm by layered insulated clothing and heated garments. This page illustrates the clothing layers adopted by heavy bomber crews in winter 1944-1945 time period, starting with wool next to skin layer, then electrically heated suit. This crew member is putting on his heated suit over his wool underwear. These images show crew members wearing the F1 Blue Bunny heated garment. Add his shearling jacket and overalls, including booties, and silk or rayon gloves, like seen in these images. May West vest and parachute harness, as in these images. Lastly, the crew member adds the flak vest, apron and helmet, oxygen mask and goggles. Fully outfitted, the crew member should look like this. This homemade display shows the glove layered concept and crew station Rio stat. The first layer worn is a rayon glove. If fine motor skills are required, the crew member can briefly remove the bulky outer gloves, but will retain the rayon layer interface if touching bare metal. The next layer is an F2 or F3 electrically heated glove. The glove electronically connects to the F1 Blue Bunny suit sleep plug. An A9A overglove shearling mitten is the last insulating layer. An index finger is needed at some of the gun stations to operate the trigger. The F1's heated suit is connected to the crew station's Q1A rheostat. There were 10 heater rheostats on the B-17 located at crew stations. This image shows the location of the rheostat on the B-17's waste gunner station. The rheostats tapped into the plane's 24-volt DC system and their maximum output was 100 watts of power. There are two outlets on the rheostat. The right one is continuously on at maximum power. The left one is connected to the variable power supply controlled by the heat dial. You will be dialing in warmth because comfort is just a twist away. This page from a 1955 Office of Surgeon General USAF document titled Medical Support of Army Air Forces in World War II discusses the effect cold had on bomber crewmen. Cold injuries were a major cause of bomber crew casualties at the start of operations. Up until January 1944, half of all crew casualties were due to frostbite. This excludes casualties due to return from missions from accidents or crew members missing in action. 7% of those with frostbite never returned to duty. The incidence of frostbite was due to lack of equipment, failure of equipment, lack of protective devices on the bombers, and lack of training. These issues were all addressed, which reduced crew casualties from the cold. The first generation F1 heated suits were troublesome. Their electrical circuits were in series. If a wire failed to deliver current, the entire suit failed to deliver heat. Also, the wires were fragile. Waist gunners and tail gunners had issues as the tail gunners were manning their stations on their knees and the waist gunners often tracked targets while on their knees. Wires would fail at these points. This image from an April 1943 report titled Modifications of the Type F1 Electrically Heated Pilot Suit shows crew members wearing the F1 Blue Bunny heated suit. Heated suits operational concerns were addressed in this field report. The suits have short life, functional defects, and inadequate heat control distribution. It was recommended all wiring be removed from the flexor surfaces. This is an example of one of the many heated suits unsatisfactory reports from the 305th Bomb Group. This one is dated February 1943. The heated suit 
gloves, and booties were unsatisfactory due to mismatch of heat between the suit, gloves, and booties. If the warmth provided by the gloves and booties is just right, the suit is too hot, hot enough to cause burns on the back of legs and stomach. The ball turret gunner was most susceptible to this type of injury. The combination was rated not acceptable. A bombardment division study concluded that over a few weeks in 1943, 75% of the frostbite cases were due to faulty equipment. High altitude flights with the waste and radio hatches open were also an issue. The F2 and F3 next generation suits were constructed with more durable wiring and adopted a parallel circuit where some heat would be delivered if part of the current path was broken. This garment change reduced the incidence of frostbite injury. The B-17's cabin heating system diagram is shown on this chart from a 1944 B-17G field service manual. The glycol heat is provided by the number two engine's exhaust. This shaded circle on the engine's exhaust is the location where the heat transfer took place. All evidence points that the cabin heating system was not very effective. Bomber modifications implemented throughout the war are shown on this table from a 1945 Army Air Forces board document titled 8th Air Force Tactical Development. The radio hatch and waste windows are enclosed in plexiglass. Frostbite cases dropped without any reduction in firepower. This image shows the waste gunner's plexiglass mount, radio room open hatch, and modified closed hatch. This page from a 1944 headquarters of the Army Air Force's Office of Flight Safety document titled Personal Equipment outlines the rules of thumb to reduce susceptibility to frostbite. Never remove your mask, gloves, or goggles when at low temperatures. This is where the Masters of the Air series fall short. The crews seem to be removing their masks quite frequently and hardly ever wear goggles. I guess if the crews were accurately represented correctly like this, the viewer would not be able to tell one from another. They were also warned against touching metal with bare skin at low temperatures. This page reinforces cold environment protection lessons from a 1945 B-29 Commander Training Manual. Frostbite has caused more crew casualties in combat. Wear rayon gloves under your electric gloves. Wear goggles during the entire mission. They protect your eyes and face from cold, flash burns, and solid fragments. This table represents the incidence of crew member cold injuries from the 8th Air Forces. The columns represent the month and year, number of cold-related injuries per 1,000 man missions, and the temperature during the bomb run. The data was plotted for ease of review. Once the revised suits, enclosed hatches, and upgraded crew training modules were in place by April of 1944, the incidence of cold casualties dropped by an order of magnitude. This table outlines the crew member's susceptibility to cold injury and which body part is more susceptible by period. Couple observations of the table. From November 1942 to December 1943, waste gunners comprised 50% of all cases. After the waste windows were plexiglassed over, they comprised only 25% of the cases. Radio operators' cold injuries also dropped from 10% to 3.9%. The ball turret gunner's susceptibility to cold is about at the middle of the pack at 10%. His face, hands, feet, and bottom were most susceptible body parts in that order. When the Masters of the Air ball turret was hit by flak, the flak fragments may have damaged the turret's rheostat. The ball turret's heated suit rheostat is located here, mounted on the front of the turret's armored seat. This would have likely kept the ball turret gunner's heated garment from receiving any current, which led to frostbite. So the Masters of the Air series has accurately represented the crew's response to the high-altitude cold environment by correct period gear usage and expected cold injuries, except for goggle usage. Crew members should be wearing their goggles at all times, not just during a bailout. If you've enjoyed this Masters of the Air clip bomber cold gear environment usage review, please consider liking or commenting on the video.